Well, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the July investment webinar. My name is Kylie Woolman, and I'm the Chief Investment Officer for Mercer in the Pacific, and I'll be hosting the webinar today. Um, first and foremost, I do just want to make sure that everybody is safe and well, or I hope that you are safe and well. Uh, a special shout out to anyone on the call uh, who is coming in from Melbourne. Um, I know you're facing the the um, situation of going back into lockdown today. So I hope that you, you are, are well and coping with that change okay. Um, we do have a really packed agenda today and a lot of very good topics, I think. So we will get into it quite quickly. I just wanted to let everybody know that we do take our questions via the Q&A function within Zoom. So if you do have a question, feel free to submit them via the Q&A function at any time during the webinar, and we will pick these up at the end. Um, so just to introduce our speakers for today. So first up, we're going to have Dr. Harry Liam. Harry is our Director of Strategic Research and Head of Capital Markets for the Pacific. And Harry's going to take us through the results of a recent survey we did really asking investors what they were thinking about as we face uh, the new normal, if you like. Uh, then we're going to have Yaying Dong, and Yaying is our market strategist here in Australia. And Yaying is going to talk to us about the rise of China. And then finally, we're going to have Mark Virchich. And Mark is our lead uh, manager researcher on equities here in Australia. And Yaying is going to have, uh, sorry, Mark is going to have a look at uh, the value factor and whether it's time to give up on value. So with that, I will hand over to you, Harry, to take us through the first topic. Thanks, Kylie. Uh, I'm going to talk to you about our client survey held in June among Australian and New Zealand investors. So we asked how they see the world post COVID-19. Uh, we had 38 clients respond, uh, representing about 300 billion in US dollars in assets under management. And uh, these clients range from pension and insurance funds to endowments and foundations, and also wealth management firms. So we had a good mix of responses. So the first question we asked was how they saw the economy recovering. And uh, as you can see from the chart, the majority of respondents still considers the U-shaped recovery the most likely outcome but an increasing number is concerned about a w-shaped recovery if the pandemic resurfaces or geopolitical events arise a small portion of respondents remains optimistic about a v-shaped recovery if a vaccine is found and at the bottom of this table we had a few clients looking at a prolonged stagnation or stagflation scenario uh, next slide please Kylie. Um, we then asked which megatrends are likely to influence asset returns over the next one to three years? So this figure highlights in dark blue on the horizontal bars uh, those that are considered most important. So ranked from top to bottom, uh, we can see that uh, deglobalization is ranked as most relevant. So this focuses on uh, protectionism, supply chain disruption, and uh, East versus West tensions. The second megatrend considered important is Big Brother, whereby uh, an increase in government debt and money supply is used for fiscal spending or market intervention. As third important megatrend, uh, new ways of working and living were considered. And here we are talking about um, physical and virtual changes to society, uh, including social distancing or even the urbanization. So if you look down at the bottom of the table, we actually see megatrends such as uh, future energy policies or climate change. So if you uh, look in general at the ranking on the y-axis, you'll see that um, economic and political megatrends are expected to dominate social and environmental considerations as immediate influence for asset returns over the next one to three years. Uh, next slide, please. Uh, we then asked who will dominate in the new normal. So the chart on the left suggests that most respondents expect multinationals to dominate rather than countries such as China or the US. China is, however, more likely to dominate than the US 
as it increases its economic and political influence. And Yaying is going to discuss this later, together with the impact for Australian and uh, New Zealand investors. Now, the other question we asked, going to the chart on the right, was how important uh, responsible investments would be under the new normal. And most clients expect the focus to be the same or increase. Uh, next slide, please, Kani. Yeah. So in this slide, we asked respondents about the most important investment lessons learned from the recent events. And again, ranked from top to bottom in dark blue, the key lesson with market volatility as we experienced is sticking to the long-term strategic asset allocation and investment objectives. In addition, uh, important to do your stress testing, uh, scenario planning, and look after your liquidity management. Now, at the bottom of the table, you'll see items such as rebalancing and collateral management. So, uh, while well, they were not ranked as most important, they were still ranked as important by many respondents. Um, next slide, please. Okay, so for this question, we asked uh, which asset classes respondents were most likely uh, to reduce or increase allocations to. So red is reduce, green is uh, increase, and the orange is neutral. So starting from the first row, clients are looking to increase allocations to equities, and in the second row, reduce allocations to sovereign bonds. So this is understandable given the low or even negative yields on many government bonds and the need to meet investment objectives. In the third row, uh, you can see interest in inflation-linked bonds is increasing given the stimulative monetary environment. There is also interest in investment grade credits as clients move up the credit curve. Demand for alternative assets is more balanced. So if you look at the reductions and increases uh, for high yield emerging market debt, bank loans, and private debt, um, clients are looking to, on balance, increase their exposure to private equity, but reduce their exposure to hedge funds. So this may reflect some of the recent experience with hedge funds in up and down markets, and also the low cash flow for hedge funds. Um, in addition, for infrastructure and real estate, uh, clients are on balance looking to reduce real estate, uh, given concerns on vacancy rates, especially uh, in the retail sector. As you can see at the bottom of the table, there is also interest in exploring other alternative assets, uh, perhaps on a more opportunistic basis. Uh, as an example, we recently had some inquiries into China, gold or uh, insurance linked securities. Uh, next slide, please, Kani. So um, we then asked participants which equity styles they favor in a new environment. So looking at the top of the table, there is strong interest in quality which is not surprising as uh, the current economic conditions will weed out the weaker companies. Um, there is also strong interest in growth as technology and healthcare benefit from recent trends. And there is also interest in value investing given its relative underperformance. So Mark is going to discuss value investing in more detail later in his session. Um, at the bottom of the chart, as you can see, there is very little interest in quant momentum or long short market neutral, which is consistent with the reduced interest in hedge funds in general. The next slide, please. So uh, here we asked respondents uh, to consider their primary sources of value add under the new normal. And as the top five in dark blue, clients consider dynamic asset allocation, uh, strategic asset allocation, uh, thematic approaches, ESG and uh, fee negotiations and passive investment. A second most important in the sort of yeah, lighter blue in the middle, uh, you can see big data, manager selection, uh, long liqui horizon liquidity provision, economies of scale, manager selection and the use of technology as well as um, artificial intelligence. Um, next slide, please. So uh, I've given you a brief summary of uh, some of our survey findings. Um, the complete survey will be mailed out to you as a webinar participants after the webinar is finished. Uh, for our top three recommendations from the survey, I, I think first, you know, we have all learned that uh, investors should stay the course, um, the withdrawal robust and stress tested portfolios uh, when markets uh, become extremely volatile. Uh, second, 
uh, investors should plan for transformation as we are facing physical and virtual changes to society with increased use of technology uh, for meetings, uh, for remote learning, and also for virtual events and conferences. Growth will be harder to come by, and that is why I think respondents actually place the premium on growth, quality, and technology. Um, is our third recommendation um, to stay competitive. Uh, investors must evolve. So while the focus of the survey has been on the more traditional investment risks, in a post-COVID-19 new normal, firms must broaden that out uh, to include business continuity risk, cyber risk, and also reputational risk. So only then can staff stay safe and uh, successful investment outcomes be delivered. So that concludes my section, and I will now hand over to Yayin, who will discuss uh, the rise of China. All right, uh, thank you, uh, Harry. Uh, and so over the next six slides, I want to share with you uh, China's economic strategy and implications for Australian and uh, New Zealand investors. So to, be, so to begin with, let's take a look at China's journey so far. So the Chinese economy has evolved significantly since she embarked on a journey of reform and opening up in the late 1970s. Since then, the economy has transformed from a rural base to an intermediate and upper end manufacturer with a moderate consumption. Per capita income has risen significantly and millions have been lifted out of poverty. Now, in the chart on the left, you can see here that in recent years, China's economic growth has slowed from an average of around 10% in the early 2000s to around 7% in 2015, and more recently to 6% last year. Many analysts have pointed out this signified the end of China's growth miracle. So while headline growth is a key message, uh, sorry, is a key measure of an economy's rate of progression, contribution and composition of growth are equally important to consider. In terms of contribution, we can see from the right-hand side chart that growth of 6% last year resulted in a raw contribution of around 800 billion, which was equivalent to around 37% of total global GDP growth. Here, you can see that even on a lower growth rate, raw contributions are much higher now compared to back in 2015, as the level of China's economy is much larger today at around 13 trillion compared to around 3 trillion back in 2005. Uh, next slide, please. From a composition perspective, we can see that uh, as early as 2015, Chinese policymakers spoke of a new normal. This focused on enhancing growth quality over quantity. Domestic consumption would play a key role over investment and export growth. You can see here that consumption as a share of GDP rose steadily from around 42% in 2008 to around 53% in 2019, and we expect this trend will continue. Rising consumption has helped to balance out growth, but it was not enough to maintain income. As a manufacturer, China's share of the value chain was only ever going to be so large. And so faced with an aging demographic, policymakers soon realized that in order to achieve developed status, China's growth model must focus on generating higher value by moving up the value chain towards an innovator slash creator or risk being stuck in the middle income trap. And so this gave rise to the Made in China 2025 blueprint. Uh, next slide, please, Kylie. So here we can see that the Made in China 2025 blueprint was launched back in 2015 with one core purpose, which is to transform China from middle to high technology manufacturing. The plan calls for 10 strategic sectors to be co-developed with the state and includes information technology, such as artificial intelligence, the internet of things and semiconductors, 
uh, robotics, green energy, aerospace, uh, ocean engineering, railway equipment, power generation, new materials, medicine, uh, and agricultural machinery. So this Made in China 2025 policy is but one component of China's broad innovation-driven development strategy under President Xi Jinping. Next slide, please, Kai. So five years in, I would say that China's innovation strategy has produced some limited success, and China is now home to a number of national champions that supply the global market. The most widely known company is Huawei. But aside from Huawei, there are also Chinese equivalent companies to some of the largest and well-known companies in the West. And so this table here shows across electric vehicles, you have BYD, uh, which is a large domestic producer uh, pitted against a Tesla across e-commerce. There's Alibaba and JD uh, versus an Amazon and eBay across online entertainment. Uh, there is a home grown uh, company known as IT uh, against the Netflix. And then with social media, there is uh, Douyin or more widely known as TikTok versus Facebook. And here the list goes on. But China's rapid modernization and innovation led growth strategy has been met with increased anxiety from the United States and other Western nations. There's a concern that China's objective towards high-end manufacturing implies an ambition not only to catch up to other advanced economies, but to surpass and to displace them in a dominant position. Next slide, please, Kylie. And so if China was to be successful with this innovation-driven approach, her growth differential will likely be maintained against the United States. Using growth projections from the International Monetary Fund, China will be on a trajectory to overtake the United States sometime over the next 10-year period. And so the return of China as the center for global economic growth and technology will mark the biggest change in geopolitics over the coming two decades with far reaching implications for trade, investment and politics. Now this increased competition for economic and technological dominance has resulted in a tit for tat confrontation between the two nations. Examples include the uh, US-China US trade war, uh, export bans across key US uh, products such as semiconductors and delisting of Chinese companies from US stock exchanges. Uh, China's Belt and Road strategy to build infrastructure and to enhance trade and investment opportunities has also been in conflict with the US foreign policy interests. The recent passage of the national security law in Hong Kong is but a, another example uh, of, of these tensions. The economic consequences of the coronavirus has seen Chinese policymakers double down on their strategy to drive internal growth and to strengthen indigenous technological capability, which will further decouple the two nations in selected sectors. Now, from an investment perspective, I would say that investors need to be ready for these changes and the associated uh, market volatility. But rather than focus on picking winners or losers, as that's quite difficult to do, being diversified across sector and geography remains a time-honored approach to deal with these challenges. Now, China's unique development model has produced some very successful companies and core technologies, which will be beneficial in a portfolio setting. Uh, next slide, please, Kai. So what about implications for Australia and New Zealand? Now we've seen that China's rising economic prosperity has benefited major trading partners. Both countries enjoy a very successful trade relationship with China. And you can see on the chart on the left-hand side that uh, exports to China in Australia represent almost around 8% of GDP and around 6.5% in New Zealand. Now China's pivot towards internal consumption suggests Australia's export mix, which is still heavily concentrated in the minerals sector, is not going to be sustainable over time. You can see this on the right hand side chart. But this is going to be less of a concern for New Zealand, where the export mix is much more uh, geared towards agriculture. Nevertheless, both countries still retain comparative advantages in tourism and agriculture, which will capitalize on rising Chinese consumerism. 
That said, recent trade relations have deteriorated between China and Australia. China has imposed export bans on Australian products, including beef and barley. And understanding the exact reasons for these bans is fairly complex, given China's increased trade commitments under the phase one trade agreement with the United States. But there are also concerns about potential impacts on iron ore, tourism, and education if relations between the two countries deteriorate. From this perspective, it remains quite clear that reaping longer term economic benefits from bilateral trade with China will require a much more careful balancing act going forward. And so to conclude, I would say that China is here to stay as a global superpower, and she will carve her own distinct path into the future. The Chinese economy will continue to grow in strength and inevitably there will be future sources of tension. But equally, there will still be plenty of opportunities to collaborate. Investors need to be ready for these trends and consider diversification across markets and geography to deal with these challenges. I'll now like to pass it over to Mark. Thank you, Yai Ying. Um, good afternoon. Look, the underperformance of AOX is here today and its persistent underperformance over the past decade as well as its lack of defensiveness um, over this time period, continues to raise questions from cl clients around why it's performed so poorly and where to from here, and more importantly, should we continue to invest in the value factor going forward? The first point I would like to make is that value investing has had a long history of success. A number of empirical studies over the years have demonstrated the existence of a value premium over the long term. This first chart refers to one of the more popular studies published by Farmer and French, which shows that from 1927 up until the financial crisis in 2008, the average outperformance of value was a significant 5.5% per annum. We continue to believe that value works for both risk and behavioural reasons. Investors are expected to be rewarded for taking greater stock-specific risk and to be able to take advantage of the exuberant extrapolation of recent earnings. Nobel Prize winning winner Daniel Kahneman also pointed out in his 2011 book, Thinking Fast and Slow, the value risk premium is embedded in the innate human trait that regards pain of loss much greater than the pleasure of gain. We see little evidence of these expected drivers of value being diluted and continue to believe that they remain valid today. However, despite the reasons to support the continued belief in value, we do stand at the end of a disappointing decade, particularly against growth. This is an unusual time because it is the strongest and longest period in which value as a style has underperformed. As we can see in the next slide, the underperformance of value has been much broader than the simple price to book value used in the farmer and French study. We can also see similar headwinds in the performance of other value factors, as well as in the performance of active managers tilted towards the value factor. As can be seen in the chart, the greater the active global equity exposure to value, the greater the likely underperformance over the past five years. This has been consistent across geographies, be it in the US, Asia, Australia, and even in a more concentrated market like New Zealand. We believe there are a number of reasons, both structural and cyclical, that help explain why value has underperformed. Firstly, it's important to note that there is nothing necessarily permanent about where value or even growth companies reside. It is expected to be transient over time. However, value companies have become the economically sensitive areas of the market, and thus it is not surprising it has underperformed given the global economy has not been strong or as broad as it has in the past. We have also seen an increase in the number of capital light businesses with greater reliance on intangible assets to drive returns, which aren't that well captured by traditional accounting-based metrics. As the next chart highlights, an important driver from our perspective has been that growth companies have simply continued to exceed expectations, delivering stronger and growing earnings compared to the more stagnant and declining earnings from value. Furthermore, the earnings generated by growth companies have often occurred at the expense of many value company business models. The persistence of these trends have amplified investor sentiment, 
caution and focus on where growth is visible, which has compounded poor performance um, from value stocks. The interest rate cycle globally has also been a powerful force, supporting long duration growth assets by bidding up the value of their future cash flows relative to the typically higher leverage value assets with more constrained expectations. Finally, as the next slide shows, the impact of falling oil prices and the repricing of environmental risks may have also had a negative impact on value, but these have become increasingly important considerations to investors, as Harry's survey highlights. As can be seen in the slide, value strategies have unfortunately been more exposed to carbon intensive industries, which may continue to offer challenges for that style going forward. Now to move on where value goes from here and why should we continue to invest? The recent health crisis has accelerated the outperformance of established market leaders and extended the underperformance of value. This is not really a surprise given the nature of the crisis and the fact that value has become increasingly cyclical over the decade. As we can see in this slide, it is not unusual given value has this historically had mixed success in crises. Value has typically been more defensive, really only in post-asset bubbles, rather than in economic shocks like 2008 and the recent health pandemic. But what it does do is do well in recovery. While we cannot have strong conviction in the type of macro environment we will face over the next few years, what we do know is that relative valuations today are trading at more extreme levels. The next slide, shows the valuation differential between the MSCI Global Growth Index and the MSCI Global Value Index dating back to 1980. The last time we saw similar differentials was at the height of the tech bubble. While it is sensible to expect a premium for sustainably growing businesses over those with more challenged prospects, the willingness to pay more for growth companies has reached more extreme levels in recent years, in particular post the um, recent pandemic which may suggest a strong opportunity for value at some point. Furthermore, to view value as being dead over the long term requires some bold assumptions around value not being rewarded, as well as the current environment continuing to deteriorate rather than stay the same. Our final chart brings this closer to home, which is where we see similar growth premiums in Australia. Thank you, Kylie. Um, and this is really the result of value being tilted towards banks and energy and away from healthcare and technology. However, while New Zealand has also seen some higher risk premiums more recently, it is expectedly more volatile driven by the greater stock market concentration and stock specific drivers, particularly with A2 Milk and Fisher and Piper of Healthcare dominating the index. Although I would like to point out that the narrowness of winners have been felt everywhere, not just in New Zealand, such as FANGs in the US and CSL and WAX stocks in Australia. We continue to believe that having exposure to value is an essential for ensuring a well-balanced equity portfolio. Robust portfolio construction is an important risk management tool in dealing with future uncertainty. As we have noted already, there are clear risk and behavioural reasons why we think the value premium exists. Markets don't last forever and they can quickly turn. The potential to perform better than other factors in an economic recovery, as well as guard against excessive extrapolation of recent trends, continues to support an allocation to value equities as a diversifying source of excess returns. This is arguably even more true and critical today, as many of the other well-known factors such as quality, growth, low volatility and momentum have all been more closely correlated with each other. Now, in thinking about the best way to access value in the current environment, the reality is that there are many different approaches and it's impossible to have a view as to which specific value factor will work in the next phase. It is difficult to test empirically because we have insufficient data and every cycle is different. With that said, we do continue, if we do continue to face an extended period of economic uncertainty and headwinds to value persist, we would expect that more judgmental, flexible and pragmatic approaches would be expected to perform better than more naive value strategies. So the key takeaways and the conclusions from my perspective would be to not give up on value, to review your portfolio factor exposures, ensure that you do have exposure to value 
but make sure that value factor doesn't dominate. Review your value managers to ensure that they're doing what they're supposed to. And the current uncertain environment may continue to favour a more judgmental selective value approach than one based on backward looking um, simple strategies, particularly those in the index form. So if you like to think about it, intrinsic value versus classic value. Thank you for that. And I'll hand you back to Kylie for questions. Thank you, Mark. And thank you to all our speakers today. Some really great insights provided there from all our speakers. Um, so just a reminder, if you do have a question, we have about 15 minutes for question time. So please submit them via the Q&A function. Um, we're not using the raise hand function today. So if you can type your question into the Q&A, that would be fantastic. While I'm giving you a minute to think about that, I will let you know that there are papers out on most of these topics today. So you will get a copy of the value paper and the wealth survey with the post webinar um, email and recording that will come out early next week. And Yaying's China paper um, is soon to be published and you will get that with the next Mercer newsletter when it comes out. So if your appetite has been wet on any of these topics today, um, there's certainly more to look at there. Um, so we'll go now to the questions. Um, there's a quick question here, perhaps Harry, just for you in the first instance. And it, it says, given how fast the COVID situation is developing, which in turn affects views on the markets, I was wondering what state the survey was completed. And I guess there's a little bit of an implied question there about depending on when the survey was completed, do we think some of these outcomes would, would be changed if we ask people again now that we've had some recovery come through? Yes, I cannot agree more with that. I mean, um, we ran the survey of the second half of June, and obviously there have been additional outbreaks since. Um, having said that, um, the chart that I showed on UWV and L referred to economic recovery, right? So I think there are different types of things that people think about. So one is the uh, economy, which is basically still on that path, looking at the latest, you know, consensus economics figures from June. Um, in terms of the stock market, that obviously has you know, rebounded using the, the V shape, I think, whereby there's a bit of a disconnect between Wall Street and Main Street. And I think the third angle people think about when they look at W, they probably think about the pandemic itself, which again, you know, where, where, depends on where you're even based in Australia, might have gone into a W. So I think so the slide is still valid in terms of economy. Um, the market has run ahead, obviously, and then uh, the pandemic itself, um, is probably more into W, I think. I think if you take the um, question now again, and there might be a slight shift to W perhaps, you know, but I, I don't think it would be much, yeah. Great, thanks, Harry. Um, yeah, Ying, I might come to you next, and I guess we can't talk about China at the moment without thinking about the situation that's unfolding in Hong Kong. So I just wondered whether you had any um, insights into how the, the Hong Kong situation might impact Chinese growth? Yeah, I mean, that's, that's a fantastic uh, question. I think at the moment, uh, the, the national uh, security law is clearly uh, a very topical issue and that's uh, only recently uh, been put in place. And I think definitely uh, from near-term growth, especially uh, for Hong Kong, uh, there's likely to be uh, some elevated levels of uh, uncertainty. But when we think about the impact of Hong Kong on broader uh, Chinese growth um, at the moment, uh, and this is using data back in 2009, is that uh, Hong Kong's economy as a percent of, uh, of China is less than 1.5%. And so that's a very small amount. And so we're unlikely to see any uh, significant uh, sort of growth uh, headwinds emerge from this. And even the response from uh, the US and some other uh, Western uh, nations on, 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 the, on, on some potential sanctions at the moment uh, still appear to be more, uh, more symbolic than substantive. And so, I mean, the situation is still uh, emerging, but in terms of direct, direct growth implications, I would think um, there's likely to be a period where we have some initial uncertainty, but over the medium term, uh, impacts could appear to be quite low. 
Okay, thanks, Yaying. I'm just coming across to you now, Mark, and there's a question here asking, I guess, about the interplay between value and its, and its underperformance um, with the level of interest rates. And I would just wonder whether you had any um, points you could elaborate, elaborate on around that question. Yeah, um, absolutely. I, I actually do believe that interest rates have had a strong influence over the relative performance of value re relative to, say, growth companies. Um, sort of as I alluded to, with rates coming down um, and valuations um, going up, the valuations of longer term and longer data growth um, becomes more valuable. So it's certainly been a strong theme. Um, it's not necessarily been the only thing, but I, I do think it's been a strong theme, along with, um, you know, I guess, the defensiveness and the focus on sort of um, near-term certainty versus uncertainty um, in the future. So if you think, thinking like in New Zealand, which has a very sort of interest rate sensitive um, market, um, you know, it's certainly had an influence there. Um, perhaps less so when it comes to sort of longer term um, growth. And, and that's where sort of the interest rate sensitives and the, and the growth stocks start to differentiate is when people start to have a different view on interest rates. And we saw a little bit of that sort of last year um, where we saw a continued performance of growth stocks, but then we saw sort of the yield plays start to sort of underperform. So growth in some respects has just continued to sort of have strong momentum behind it, um, irrespective of, of dynamics. And for me, it's, it's really just accentuated the, 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 I guess, the valuation premium that growth stocks have had um, over value stocks as opposed to necessarily being the only driver of, of, of the relative performance differential. Okay, thanks, Mark. Um, Harry, just coming back to you, and there's a question here um, that's linking back to the survey, and it's looking at preferences within property and infrastructure and whether there was a distinction made or, at all between listed and unlisted um, and to the extent that we might not have got insights around that from the survey whether perhaps you had any um, comments you could make around investor preferences for, for listed versus unlisted um, yep so um, so to be fair no we did not ask specifically for listed versus unlisted for infrastructure or real estate um, because again <laughs> so we tried to make it like you know 10 questions in 10 minutes um, and it's uh, just to separate the sectors first before I go into listed versus unlisted. Um, so I think if you look at the table that I showed you, I, I think so. Investors have some concern on infrastructure, obviously, on airports and you know toll roads and the reduced traffic there. And again, it, it all depends. Again, just like in real estate, on the quality of the assets you hold, uh, and also the type of assets, whether you hold like utilities. So I, I think, but. I think to be fair, there's probably more concern on real estate than infrastructure, um, because infrastructure is an essential service, but real estate is more like um, very dependent on location. And especially as you know, there is really concern on uh, both uh, retail because of the um, you know, re reduced traffic and demand, and also on commercial because of the vacancy rates and how companies, you know, including ourselves, will actually deal with uh, their staff going forward in terms of um, we will stay at home and a lot of people do seem to like working at home. Um, so that's where we get most queries, I think. Um, in terms of listed versus unlisted, well, that, that's a funny one. I mean, I think um, when COVID hit, you basically saw that the valuation lag, uh, that led to some quite interesting results in whereby, um, you know, unlisted, even real estate managers actually increased their valuations while equity marks were down like you know, 20 or 30%. So on that basis, you know, that, that was not healthy, we think. Uh, so now the situation is sort of reversed. So it's, it's probably more fair at, at the moment, I, I, I would say. Um, so they sort of caught up with that. So, but again, as you know, unlisted is, is very much a uh, lagged federation play. So you, you have to take that into account when you invest. Um, and again, you know, the advice we usually give to clients is that um, if you want diversification and liquidity, obviously, or DAA, you go for the listed version, but Normally, if you're big enough and you can put up together your own portfolio of quality assets, then we recommend you go unlisted. Yeah. 
Yeah, thanks, Harry. And I think I'd um, echo those comments in the way that we think about it from a funds perspective, where if we've got the illiquidity budget and we can access, you know, a diversified portfolio of quality assets, then we would have a preference for unlisted. And I don't think the crisis period has changed that stance, but we can use listed from time to time, um, obviously, because it is more liquid and it is better to use within a dynamic asset allocation um, process. Um, so, Harry, I'm just going to stick with you now because we've only got a couple of minutes left. Um, there is a question here just asking around quant and how we would define that and is it really referring to multi-factor investing? Um, well, the trouble with quant is that there's actually not a single definition, but, but let me explain maybe, you know, what, what I think of quant is. In, and again, I had a, a bit of a debate with Cliff Asnes at some stage about this because there are different, many different types of quants. I think there's equity-based quants like, like Cliff or, you know, Demo or like um, who look at value and momentum and then consider themselves as, as you know, a quant house. Uh, that, that's one type of quant. And I think um, Mark has probably covered that style of quant a little bit. Um, there are also more deep quants managers and especially in hedge funds, as you know. So like, uh, again, different variations, extremely, uh, you know, uh, secretive firms exist as well up to, uh, you know, funds that nobody can buy anyway, like Renaissance, who trade on like, you know, nanoseconds. Um, so I think what, what is happening is in terms of the, the competition of quants is definitely increasing because we get a lot more people who have more access to big data, more close to the exchange and, you know, have very fast supercomputers. So I think, I mean, I'm not surprised that, that you know, um, interest is so low um, because again, a lot of, especially hedge funds, they use quant strategies and then they lever them up. And during a crisis, the leverage aspect is the thing that gets hit because, you know, financing rates basically, you know, uh, go through the roof. So, um, you know, I, I think, <laughs> to be honest, quant and leverage is not a good combination in some periods. And, you know, we've just been through such a period. Um, uh, well, I hope that that answers the question. I mean, there's another type of quant which I do like a little bit more, which is trend following, um, because that can diversify. So. No, that's a very comprehensive answer. Thank you, Harry. Um, so we are coming up to time and I think we've gotten through all of the audience questions today. So thank you again to our speakers for providing some great insights today. Um, as you do leave the webinar, you will get a very short three question um, survey. So it would be great if you could just take a minute or two um, to complete that survey because it really helps us make these webinars relevant for you as we're planning the next ones. Otherwise, we will have another webinar coming at you in August and we hope that you're able to join us again for that. Um, in the meantime, please stay safe and well. Thank you very much.